our Father and our God, again, we thank you that we are able to stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. I ask that the Holy Spirit take charge of the hour. We know that this is the infinite word of our God and we know our limitations. May the Holy Spirit strip away the fog of human logic and the error of the reasoning of the flesh, but seal to our hearts the purposes of our God. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together uh, in the uh, second epistle of Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had started the paragraph, which begins at verse 15 of chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 15. The subject of the second epistle of uh, Corinthians is suffering and joy. We see in the first couple of paragraphs seven reasons why the Lord brings suffering into the Christian life, none of which have anything to do with personal sin. I'm not suggesting that there's not suffering which may come as the natural result of sin, but that is not the subject of this context. The Lord is very kindly, very lovingly bringing difficulty and suffering into our lives in order that our hope might be increased, in order that we might learn to trust him, trust in him and not ourselves, and that we might learn how to comfort others and, and so forth. As we closed out the 14th verse, we had the amazing revelation that in the day of the Lord, the cause of our, of our boasting, of our glorying, uh, of our joy and rejoicing uh, was uh, in each other. Uh, it's not in what our personal goals might be, not what our flesh might desire, because in the, in the last, the final analysis, the subject of our rejoicing is going to be each other. And that is when uh, he returns, the day of the Lord Jesus. And I, I think the Holy Spirit assumes that, that we know that God has a purpose that's consummated in Christ. And we do look forward to that day with great anticipation. We're six years along into this ministry and we've looked for him to come every day and we will continue to do so. Uh, I believe personally, uh, I know uh, that uh, whatever I do, it's the Lord, whether I do whatever I do or I don't do, the Lord wills, uh, the Lord willing, uh, I will continue on until I can't, can no longer speak. Uh, I'd probably be doing this if I was blind. Uh, we are anticipating our Lord to return uh, we have our reasons here at Blessed Hope Forever for believing that that may soon come, may come sooner than many of us expect. And so we're going to stay the course. Beginning then in verse 15, we get down to the subject at hand, but apparently if we look carefully between verses 15 and, and 24, there was some argument that, that Paul was furthering his own gain or, or his own, uh, means in this persuasion. The word confidence, if you have the authorized version, is persuasion. Uh, I was minded or I, 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 uh, I will would be a, a better translation, uh, possibly to come unto you ahead of time in order that you might have a second uh, grace. The word is charis, grace. Uh, uh, that second grace namely was to pass by my means of you with your assistance. I would pass by means of you uh, in Macedonia. I would, I would come out of Macedonia back to you again in order that you might have the next opportunity to, to further me along in my journey towards Judea. I don't see any, uh, I'm not reading any, or I don't sense any conceit on the part of Paul, just a simple statement that that benefit accrues 
to believers who aid other believers in the work of the Lord. We read in Colossians that uh, he who is taught in the word, uh, let him who is taught in the word communicate unto him that teaches in all good things. Uh, be not deceived, God's not mocked. Uh, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And I've always heard that, that you know, that, that always applies to, to sin or to evil or to activities like dancing or going to movies or, or the, or the, it's, you know, it's, that's the, that, what that's talking about is, Steve, is that's the young sowing their wild oats or, or whatever. But the context, folks, uh, clearly involves ministry. Uh, the context is is your ability to materially you know materially aid uh, someone else in the work of the Lord, uh, but I don't think it's limited to, to just that. I think it's just you know a, a word of encouragement. Uh, any way that we uh, help one another. Uh, you know, that which you sow, you're going to reap if you sow to the flesh. You know, you, you spend all of your material possessions, whether it be money or the ability to aid in some way. If you do it all for the flesh, you're going to reap vanity. You know, I ain't, you ain't going to take none of that with you to glory. Uh, not going to be any lasting, eternal result from that. But if you sow to the Spirit, there's going to be an eternal uh, result. And that's the context of that verse. And so I believe it's the Holy Spirit pointing out that, that one aspect of that rejoicing in the day of the Lord is how we've worked together with others in the cause of Jesus Christ. You know, it's, it's interesting to me that in Malachi, the Lord has a book of remembrance for for those who even even thought of, upon his name and uh, those who hear the Holy Spirit. It says there's a benefit, there's a grace. Uh, uh, that's the word I want to use. There is a grace that accrues to you in working with others in the work of Christ. Now, Paul said that that, that was my confidence, but, uh, but Paul didn't come. You know, it's, it's quite obvious he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't go to Corinth. He, he wrote the first epistle, and then less than a year later, he writes the second epistle. Uh, but he hadn't been to Corinth. He, he spent 18 months or more in Corinth. Uh, he, was, he was an integral part of that, that fellowship, that, that congregation. He was there in the beginning of, of the formation of that fellowship where a witness for Christ took place in one of the most carnal societies of the known world at that time. Uh, the believers at Corinth were close to his heart, but Paul didn't go. And it would appear as though there were some at Corinth who were just a little bit blustered by the, you know, the, the letter that the Holy Spirit wrote uh, through Paul. Uh, and so they're arguing, you know, if you kind of read between the, the lines there, it's, uh, you know, they were probably saying, well, look, you know, he, 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 he said he'd come and he didn't come. Uh, you know, maybe he got more money over there or, or, or some other uh, criticism. I don't know what it was, but he didn't come. And so it begins at the 17th verse, when I therefore was minded to come uh, when I made up my mind to come to Corinth, when I willed to come to Corinth, did I use lightness? Did I employ the, the fickleness? The word in the Greek means to be light in weight, something that's not heavy. Uh, that's what the word means. Uh, uh, sometimes it's translated fickle. Uh, it's not a word that you commonly hear nowadays, but you know, did he, did Paul vacillate in his opinions? Uh, yeah. When I will things like this, do I do it after the mind of the flesh? Uh, 
so so that with me there should be and it's and it's articulated in the greek the yay yay and the nay nay that presence of that definite article there uh, typically that indicates identity what is the yay yay and the nay nay well they were a society i suppose that, that you know not a whole lot different than ours i guess they were a society that took oaths uh i you know i swear by the hair of my head or something like that you know when i was a boy it was cross your heart hope to die you know that you know i don't know what it is today but the Christ came along and in the Sermon on the Mount said that they shouldn't swear by anything on earth or anything in heaven. In fact, if one gets down to it, he doesn't have much control to swear by anything. If, if I swore by the hair on my head, it'd probably fall out tomorrow. Uh, if, if you swear on something tomorrow, tomorrow may never come. And so uh, you, you don't have the power, folks, to change your life. And then Christ said, let the manner of, of life, uh, your life, uh, let, let your conversation be yay, yay, and nay, nay. And I believe that that's the one that's referred to here by the definite article. But as God is true, verse 18, our word, our preaching toward you is not yea and nay. It isn't yea, yea and nay, nay with God. Folks, God doesn't have that same problem that we have. God never made a decision. God decided, and, and but he never made a decision. If you know, I mean, if I understand making a making a decision, it's it's I don't know whether to, to you know to take apple pie or or peach cobbler. I don't know, you know, if I want French fries or tater tots or, or, you know, but, uh, you know, so, you know, I've got these options that are presented to me that are pretty weighty decisions, you know, but, but, but God never made a decision in the sense that it was a toss up between two potential, uh, possibilities. And I believe the 17th verse is saying that there's a difference between functioning out of the old man and operating under the new man. Uh, under the old man is, the, is the, the squirrely sort of nature of my decisions, wishy-washy nature of my own decisions, but, but not as far as the new man is concerned. It's God's work, it's God's will, it's God's plan, and to me, the underlying theme of the 17th verse is surprise, the sovereignty of God. So I'm not bothered by Paul telling the Corinthians he would do one thing just to learn that he did another. You know, there's many a, a Christian who doesn't uh, let a, an opportunity go by without stressing uh, man's responsibility. Uh, you know, but when I'm dead and, and gone, if the rapture doesn't occur, and if I live and, and I just die a natural death, uh, uh, you know, at least I'd like to say that whatever opportunities I had to emphasize something, I, I emphasize God and not man. It's, if there's any emphasis in this book, it's not man's responsibility, it's God's sovereignty, but there is a place there for obligation on the part of the believer. Uh, there obviously is, or there would be no bema, no judgment seat uh, of Christ for the believer. You know, I know that I make plans in my own mind and in my own will, but uh, in, in which I of, often vacillate you know, like, well, you know, the weather's not good, so, you know, I can't go here or there. So the problem is, is that I'm, I'm faced in with this precarious nature of human reasoning. Uh, but is that what I, I use? I mean, is, 
Do you honestly believe, you believers at Corinth, do you honestly believe that I sat down and I weighed all those kinds of things when I was deciding to come to Corinth? I think before we're through with the passage, we'll find out that, the, that there wasn't any variance at all in this conclusion. He submitted it to the Lord. Do I purpose these things according to the flesh? And that, that to me is a clear indication that the Holy Spirit was working uh, for the good of the believers at Corinth and of course for the good of Paul and, and his companions. And, and that, that contrast between what Paul willed and what God determined really frustrates Bible teachers. Uh, you know, there's lots of such passages, but, but boy, this one's right here, at the, I mean, right at the top. Uh, why should you contrast God's perfect sovereign will with a decision whether or not to buy a Greyhound bus ticket to Corinth? In fact, it's, it's the absolute contrast between the apparent subjects of this paragraph that make it so difficult for the commentator. You know, in a, in a couple of or three verses, we're, we're talking about Paul's decisions as to whether or not to go to Corinth. And then we have several verses on the sovereignty of God. You know, the, the subject that's introduced is Paul's decision as to whether to go to Corinth or not go to Corinth. Was, so was that based on the situation that surrounded him, the mind of the old man uh, or the mind of the new man? And then beginning at verse 18, the subject suddenly turns to God. God is faithful. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among us. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and, and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. In verse 20, uh, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now, he which establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who, ha who has also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Uh, moreover, I'm going to call God as a witness upon my life. I didn't come to Corinth in order to spare you. I think the Holy Spirit is saying to the believers at Corinth uh, who were trying to rationalize, you know, this, he, he was, the, he was the fellow that, you know, that helped us organize the, the fellowship here. He was there, he was here for a long time and then he just went away. Uh, whether he ever wrote any letters or not, you and I, we really don't know. But if, if we want to build a story in between the lines, it seems as though there might have been an argument at Corinth that is partially Paul's fault and that he wasn't there. And, and the reason he wasn't there is because something else was more attractive to him than, than the welfare of the believers at Corinth. It's quite obvious in the, in the second epistle that that's not true. And, and so surely the Holy Spirit's given us a glimpse into the heart of Paul. Moreover, the heart of God. Uh, but his great concern was this body of believers at Corinth. As far as we know, he spent more time there than, than, than at any other place. So, you know, the great need for these Christians there and what you and I as believers need to know is that God is working in our lives. God is working in your life. Uh, we've got all the scriptures to see that and yet I'm certain that most of us really never come face to face with that fact. You know, if you haven't read the commentators on the last portion of the second of, of Second Corinthians chapter one, you ought to do it. You know, it's a, it's an amazing mishmash of words trying to rationalize something as mundane as as travel plans to Corinth versus the greatness of God. Uh, how do you how do you put that together unless you realize that God is involved every single day and every moment of, of our lives? 
you are where you are and you're in the mess that you're in because God loves you. He, he either works all things together for your good, folks, or he lied. I don't think he lied. You know, we're somebody, you know, we're on terribly thin ice if if to if we're to suggest that one might praise God for sin. That's that's not the thing that I'm trying to present here. But I praise God that the Christian soars higher as he knows more and more of the grace of God. What did the Lord mean when he asked who would love him the most? You know, he to whom the most has been forgiven. I'm not suggesting that you folks go out and sin a lot so you can say, well, I've been forgiven a lot. I'm not, I'm not suggesting we do that. But I do believe that we don't worship a defeated God. You know, I talk to many Christians and I know, that, I know that they wouldn't suggest that, but their entire attitude seems to be that God is defeated. You know, nothing's working out. You know, this isn't happening. That isn't happening. I, I know all those things are true, but it, it can't possibly apply to me. You know, does that mean God's not getting done what God wants to get done? You know, the difference between whether I'm in glory and whether I'm in hell is the grace of God. We'll live together with him because and only because Christ died in our place. Yet the, the prevalent Christian attitude is that we're going to live together with him because we were faithful, because we prayed, because we went to church, because we did this, we did that, or the other thing. Folks, does that exalt God? Does that exalt the grace of God? No. And what the Holy Spirit does here is simply lay out for you and I the fact that even the decisions in Paul's life was part of the plan of God. I hope you see that in the text. And, and it was for their good. You know, we, we say we believe that all things work together for good to them that love God and are caught, you know, but what we really mean is, well, that's as long as, as, well, as I'm trying. You know, you don't understand my, you don't understand, Steve, you know, in my life there's this deep sin. Therefore, all things can't work together for the good. Dearly beloved, God works all things after the counsel of his own will. Well, pastor, that's true. That's true, of course, when I don't stand in the way. You know, but when my, when my sin and my, my willfulness and my ignorance and my foolish nature, when it stands in the way, then, oh, poor God, he just can't get what he wants done. You know, and on and on and on we, we go where we're trying to, rationalize our own position or minimize the power of God. And I think we need to know how God works. God works, folks, in the little things. And what the Holy Spirit does is make a change between verses 17 and 18, which is dramatic. But as the God is true, the word in the Greek is pastuo, faith. It's not the word for truth, true. They translated it that, but it's pastuo, faith. God is faithful. Romans 3.3, 3, what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. You know, in, the, in the first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 1, ninth verse, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And we say, well, Paul did that. Apollos did that. You know, the, the YouTube banner did that. My advertising did that. My, you know, uh, uh, no, God did that. It's because God is faithful that they were called into the fellowship of his son. Now, if God was faithful in calling them into the fellowship of his son, did he, did he then desert them? Abandon them? Um, uh, 
allow them to live their lives in any way they wanted with no interest from God at all. God just takes a step back and just says, or was he teaching? Are they the better, uh, are they the better believer, the better husband, the better wife, the better employee, the better servant, the better pastor, the, the better teacher because of the things that he brings into their lives? God is faithful. Yea and nay are carnal. Our word toward you was not yea and nay because God's word is not yea and nay. Man's word is yea and nay. And that's where it ought to stop. You, know, you can't swear by things in heaven or things on earth. Verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. You know, they say that there's there's two words that are the same in all, all the languages of the, of the world. Uh, those two words are uh, hallelujah and amen. You know, there's I think there's three. There's hallelujah, there's amen, and okay. I'll just threw that in for free. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. If you go over to 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, I just want to kind of bring that into this discussion here. Somebody said to me one day, well, the Lord called me to the mission field and 20 years ago, I didn't go. My life's been a, a wreck ever since. You know, you know, that's not the way Peter started out. The, you know, it's, he, we go to Peter's uh, epistles here. You know, he doesn't say, well, I'm, si I'm Simon Peter. The Lord called me to be a disciple, but I denied him. Uh, my life's been ruined ever since. It doesn't say that. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. How did they obtain that faith? By the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's how you obtain like precious faith. By means of the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And now listen, uh, verse three, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And you read that and you say, boy, that's that's wonderful, you know, that he did that for, for you, but he, I'm not so sure he did that for me. You know, the problem with us is is that 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 exceeding great and precious promises, well, what that is, Steve, that's that's lots of money, that's having that's lots of fun, that's having our own way, that's lots of material possessions. Folks, what value do we place on the promises of God? What value do you place on the promises of God? Again, verse 20, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Why speak of the promises of God? Because that is, that's everything that pertains to life and godliness. Even as to whether, even even as to whether or not to minister, uh, 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 it, it, that includes uh, the Apostle Paul. That has to include the Apostle Paul going to Corinth on schedule. Sit back a, mo a moment and just think about how everything is in your life. God is, the, his timing is perfect. We, we have a hard time with that. Now, he who established us, you didn't establish yourself. 
Now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us as God, if he belongs to God, if they belong to God, then God's working all things together for good for Paul and the believers at Corinth. Not only that, he sealed us. It isn't something he's doing. It's something he did. It's, it's done. It's, it's a completed action, a, a, point, a pointed uh action in the Greek. It's not linear in action, but the word is different in the Greek than it is in the English. He sealed us and he gave us an earnest of the spirit in our hearts. The earnest of the spirit occurs here and it occurs in Ephesians. And, you know, it's like, okay, we know what earnest means, earnest money. Or, you know, I, I want to buy your house. So I put up some earnest money and, uh, you know, a thousand dollars. Right. That means which means that uh, if I don't buy it, I forfeit a thousand dollars. That's the way we handle earnest money. But earnest money was, wasn't handled that way with the Greeks. Earnest money put the individual under obligation to finish the transaction. That earnest money in our society gives us the opportunity to get out of the finishing the transaction. We just forfeit the earnest money, but. Uh, there was no thought of forfeiture in the Greek mind. You know, the, the sealing is a word that speaks of security. Who has made us secure and committed himself to complete the transaction by giving us the spirit in our hearts. But the earnest of the spirit, well, what is that? What is that? I don't know how to explain it. Folks, if, if in, in all the midst of the mess in, in your life, uh, if, if, if in, in all that, if you don't deep in your heart have a subtle joy and a subtle peace, then I can't speak to you of the earnest of the Spirit. No matter how deep the suffering, no matter how intense the difficulty, the trial that you're going through, no matter how devastating the sin, the your frustration over the sin of the flesh, if you don't have a deep, settled peace and confidence in the Lord, then I don't know how to explain the earnest of the Spirit. However, if you do have it, what would you sell it for? You know, would you prefer a million bucks? Uh, you know, I don't know. A big ranch in Montana? I don't know. Is there anything in, in life that could equal the earnest of the Spirit? Folks, I don't know how he loves me, but I know he does. My Bible speaks of joy unspeakable, of, of peace that passes understanding. So it's not surprising to me. I can't speak of it or understand it. I, you know, if you do not have the earnest of the Spirit, then what I say won't make a lick of sense to you anyway. So, you know, I can't describe it. But I know as a Christian, I have no more conscience of sin. I'm dead to sin. I'm not suggesting that you don't sin. I'm suggesting to you that one aspect of the earnest of the Spirit is that you do not have a conscious guilt of sin. And that is staggering. That tempt, well, that tempts me to believe that then I can just, well, I can just sin with impunity that I can be presumptuous, that I can take God for granted, everything which would devastate human logic until suddenly I'm brought up short and I realize that the, the constraints, the reins in my life are the love of God, not the law of God. Not the fear of God, the love of God. Personally, I find that to be a, quite a restraint. I find it more difficult to move against God when I understand his love than to move when I think I'm breaking his law. You know, at first it might seem easy, but to continually move against the love of God is physically draining and, and exhausting. It's devastating. The earnest of the spirit to me is something I can't describe, but I know that it foreshadows glory. And suddenly I begin to understand the earnest of the Spirit, what heaven might be like, what that fellowship 
in communion with God, which is unbroken because you know, he sealed me, he established me. There's, and there's nothing in life. There's no money, no success, no happiness. Uh, there's no potential course of action that you could propose for me for which I'd give up the earnest of the spirit. I believe that throughout the years, Christians have died before they would do anything that in their minds might break that line of communion and fellowship with God. The last two verses here then bring me uh, back to his schedule to go to Corinth. I just want you to know that it was God operating. It was to spare you. It was to spare you. I didn't come to Corinth. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Paul didn't know that until he wrote it. I believe Paul is writing what God's telling him to write. And when he gets to the 23rd verse, moreover, I call God for a witness upon my life. That's why I didn't go. That wouldn't surprise me. I'm certain that, folks, that that passage tells you and I that there was a God who loves, who's faithful, who established, who sealed, who gave the earnest of the Spirit, who worked in Paul's and Silas and Timothy's life for the good of the believers at Corinth. And to me, the paragraph of 15 to 24 is Romans 8, 28, all right? Which Christians tend to tout pretty loudly yet they seem to believe so little. There is nothing in this world that can equal rolling back in the arms of a sovereign God and saying, I'll wait on you. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.